So Paige, it's fantastic to have you join us today. It'd be great if you could just tell us a bit about your background. Well, firstly, thank you so much for having me on. I've been very excited about doing this. It's kind of a unique opportunity that I haven't done before. Um, and sure, uh, a little bit about my background. I, uh, after completing a number of advanced engineering degrees in biomedical and mechanical engineering, I decided to make a little bit of a, a right turn into management consulting. Um, I dabbled with a startup during my master's and that really just made it painstakingly apparent that I needed a crash course in all things business. Mm -hmm. um, so I joined McKinsey where I spent a good chunk of my career consulting companies, Fortune 100 companies on things like data strategies and digital transformations, or even standing up innovation centers. Um, and I guess <laughs> as this will resonate probably with anyone who's done management consulting, but over time, the airports, uh, the airport food, the flights, the hotel, it all wears off. And so I decided to transition into industry. Uh, I spent a couple years at the Vector Institute before he approached me about a, an opportunity at TD's very own AI lab, and I've, I've been here ever since. We actually um, had Tommy present a talk a couple of years ago at our Deep Learning Summit in oh, Toronto. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's fantastic to hear an update from, uh, from your team and from their six. So kind of jumping straight in there with quite a, a big question, I guess. Um, what do you find exciting within AI currently and also looking a bit further ahead for its potential for the future? Uh, great question. <laughs> so you're, you're, you're probably looking to hear a little bit about some of the things that I think are the leading edge applications coming down the pipeline that we expect to hit the industry soon. Um, and I could easily talk about Graham Taylor uh, from the University of Guelph. Uh, he's using AI technology to make the agricultural field more efficient, food systems. Um, he's like, for example, he's developing smart insect traps that are using image recognition to identify pests and it negates the need to actually have to send those samples off to labs, reducing overall cycle times in the industry. Um, or I could highlight uh, Frank Redzik's company, Winterlight, uh, who's using speech recognition. Uh, they provide an app accurate objective measure of one's cognitive health. Basically, uh, users describe an image that they see on a tablet and based on, you know, hundreds of variations in pitch, vocabulary, and grammar, these things combine to predict an accurate objective measure of things like depression or the early onset of Alzheimer's disease. So I think those two applications are absolutely fascinating. But if, if I were to say what the front running thing that I think is exciting about the future of AI is, I think in many ways, it's actually kind of Canadian, if that makes any sense. <laughs> so what do you mean exactly by it's Canadian? Uh, okay, so let me, let me back that up a little bit. Um, firstly, I do not mean to discount the incredible contributions that folks have made all around the world. There's absolutely brilliant people contributing to the field globally. Uh, it's just that some of the most um, prominent and influential, think influential thinkers within the field of AI um, are actually Canadian. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can give you some examples. There's Rich Sutton, who's pioneering re reinforcement learning at Aiden, Amy and Edmonton, which is a, one of Canada's three AI institutes. Um, you have Jeffrey Hinton. Uh, many refer to him as the godfather of AI. Um, and him and Yashua Bengio, Yashua Bengio heads up Mila in Montreal, another Canadian AI institute. They actually just recently won the Turing Award for their contributions to the field of AI. So we have some really incredible theoretical research talent here in Canada. Um, and that's actually, Canada was the first country in the world to come out with a national AI strategy. Uh, and the reason they did this is because a lot of our AI talent would actually end up leaving our jurisdiction to go to the U.S. and, you know, become the chief AI officers of Facebook and Google. Uh, and so the government said, well, we're experiencing a lot of brain drain. How can we reverse this? And so I kind of touched on two of the three uh, AI institutes. There's also Vector in Toronto, which I mentioned I uh, spent a couple of years at. Um, and the intent of these institutes was to increase the production of machine learning talent in the country so that labs wouldn't pick them off from abroad. Tech companies would actually relocate and open up shops in our economy. Um, and, you know, in the past decade, we've seen countless labs uh, open up in the area, which just gives these researchers, you know, a breadth of more exciting opportunities. So it just, I guess it seems like uh, Canada has that AI it factor and, you know, I'm excited to see how that evolves. 
It's something that we've actually seen through our events as well. We held our first deep learning summit in Montreal um, a few years ago and we've kind of alternated with Toronto since and they definitely we've seen that growth year on year so you're doing something right <laughs> I think. <laughs> so taking it a bit of a step back um, what does your day-to-day -day look like for you um, in your current role as head of AI business management at Layer 6 AI at TD? A day in the life of me. Um, <laughs> I, I spend a, a good chunk of my time uh, meeting with lines of business across the bank to really get a better understanding of what their challenges are and whether or not um, AI can play a role and, and help them out with those challenges. And to do this, I lean a lot on our layer six machine learning scientists, on their expertise and our engineers uh, to explore the art of the possible and also really to keep me grounded in reality. So it's a dream big, um, but they bring me back to, to reality. Uh, within the bank, our TD partners, uh, we work a ton, or I guess I spend a lot of time with our control partners, which really keeping layer six in line, and also with TD's model validation uh, pioneers, the really leading edge thinkers who hold us to some of the highest standards in the Western hemisphere. Um, it's their job to, I guess, validate our models integrity and ultimately to safeguard our financial sector. And they've done an incredible job in keeping up with the pace of innovation. Um, and I guess uh, the other team that I spent a ton of time with is our enterprise machine learning team. Uh, we truly wouldn't have had any impact without these folks. So a special shout out to Matt, Zane, Naresh, Chris, and Gunnalan, if you're listening. You guys move mountains for us on a daily basis. So thank you guys for enabling us to, to be successful. Wow, it sounds like a lot of stakeholder management there. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> yeah. So Layer 6 was only acquired a couple of years ago. And so how kind of since then has the integration with the rest of the bank been playing out for you and your teams? Oh, well, with all acquisitions, we're, we're a small company and a massive bank, so there's really lots to learn and a long way to go uh, before we can truly claim we've transformed ourselves, TD Bank, into the world's leading AI-powered bank. Uh, and to be clear, that is the goal. Uh, mm -hmm. We're a bunch of stubborn folks who, who won't stop short, and the ambition on this team is stifling. We have incredible talent inside TD and inside Layer 6, and I honestly wouldn't put... Uh, put my money on another horse. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess speaking a bit to the listeners that are maybe at the beginning of their career or looking to advance, what would you say the best way to do that is in industry? And also what path did you take to get to where you are now? Hmm. Uh, so there are so many, so many different paths in industry to get into AI. That's a very open-ended question, but I can certainly share uh, my own experience. I, I left McKinsey to join TD's digital channels doing digital strategy and innovation. And under the innovation portion of my mandate, I was exploring all these emerging technologies like blockchain and IoT uh, and AI. And I guess from where I was sitting, AI appeared to be the heaviest hitter and the ethical considerations at the time just really fascinated me. And so I knew I wanted to to pivot to build a foundation in the field. So I actually proactively sought out opportunities, uh, which basically means I started putting my hand up for extra work, those stretch assignments. Um, and so I would take on little, little pieces of AI assignments all across the bank. And, um, and I also started asking our HR group, um, you know, how I could progress. And they were incredibly helpful. I owe a, I owe a lot to them. Um, I guess this is one of those ask and you shall receive principles. <laughs> uh, it's either that or people in the bank got so annoyed with me constantly asking to be involved in AI that when a secondment opportunity came up at the Vector Institute, they knew it was the only way to get me off their backs. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to do it. <laughs> so jokes aside, I owe a huge thanks to TD's head of digital channels, Rizwan Kalfan, uh, and their head of HR at the time, Danielle Dakotis. They, they truly took the time to understand what my passions were uh, and to build a bridge for me to get there. So if I were to give everyone a, a pro tip, surround yourself with people who will invest not just in your company's mission and vision, but in your own. So you touched a bit on ethics there as well. That's something I wanted to dig a bit deeper on. Um, a topic that regularly comes up during our podcasts is looking at AI for social good and more about that positive impact we can have. So I wondered if you could just tell us a bit more about your particular interest in that and what you're working on in the AI for good space. Let me share some of the social good areas where I think uh, AI can play a role. Uh, and let me start by saying AI is an incredibly powerful tool. And so for all the Marvel fans out there, uh, we all know that with great power comes great responsibility. 
um, the idea of applying these technologies to do some good for the world rather than, I don't know, like put another dollar in an investment banker's pocket and no investment bankers, just an analogy. It just gets my brain going. Um, but so let me share some of the, I have a couple, I guess, examples that come to mind. Um, and one of them started not too long ago when I discovered uh, the prevalence, uh, the unfortunate prevalence of human trafficking in our country. And I think we can all agree that one case is just one case too many. Um, and as many of you know, these, these heinous crimes um, generate revenue and these criminals often try to launder uh, these funds through the banks. And the banks have an obligation to identify and stop these transactions from happening. Um, which to me means it's actually an area where Canadian banks can come together alongside law enforcement uh, and AI experts um, to, to stop these crimes in their tracks. Uh, and one of the reasons I actually think Canada is so well positioned, um, Canada, Canada has big five, five big banks mm -hmm. and those big five banks bank about 90% of the Canadian economy. And not only that, they're actually all headquartered in Toronto. So mm -hmm. it's, it's just really easy for you know five people from five banks to get together and collaborate on something like this uh, versus like let's compare ourselves to the us the big five banks there bank roughly 35 percent and you have six thousand some odd other players uh, dispersed across the country which just makes like these kind of joint collaboration efforts uh, much more challenging mm. and i mean it's incredible that how banks can leverage that technology to fight those kinds of crimes really but what about helping people with kind of more I guess basic banking needs are there any social benefits of the AI can enable in that space as well yeah another area of interest centers around um, helping the financially vulnerable populations uh, around half of the Canadian population is living paycheck to paycheck uh, mm -hmm. and even a small incidence um, a broken furnace or a fender bender can send the most well-intentioned people who are planning well into a financial death spiral. Um, and, and I guess another contributing factor to this is our economy is shifting towards uh, a flexible on-demand workforce, um, perpetuating the already existing income volatility issues for, again, over half of Canadians. Uh, so like a mistimed inbound check and an outbound check uh, means they could get hit with things like late fees or, you know, if you miss a payment on your credit card, punitive interest fees, or, and just it, this compounds our situation further. And they're the people who need it uh, the least in our economy. Mm -hmm. And so similar to how um, the flexible workforce economy is using AI to predict demand and vary workforce accordingly, AI can play a role here in helping predict someone's cash flow. Um, you know, what is their account balance? Are they going to go into that insufficient fees and, and get that hit? And if we can predict that in advance and give people notice, uh, we're giving them better line of sight and really control into their situation um, so that they can improve their financial outcomes. That's fantastic. And I want to just touch on, um, I guess, a topic that's pretty central to this podcast. So as yourself, you're a leading female working in AI at the moment. What piece of advice would you give to your younger self when you were joining the field and first starting out? Oh, great question. Um, jump in with two feet. <laughs> I think a lot of times we, we shy away from things or we're worried about getting things wrong and, and these hold us back. AI is going to be a foundational knowledge block that's going to underpin so many future jobs and having a firm understanding of the basic concepts and capabilities and and even hurdles and limitations. It's just, from my point of view, it's a no risk maneuver uh, for, for a very large portion of people. Um, if you really want to transition, Toronto, like I said, has some of the world's top global AI talent. Um, you know, you can check out the amazing programs that are offered um, by the Vector Institute or Mila in Montreal and Amy in Edmonton. There's a ton of online courses offered through U of T. And again, the godfather of AI, Jeffrey Hinton, came from there. There's incredible programs. Um, uh, or, or at McGill, there's, there's a lot of great courses and programs that are offered online through these institutes and our educational systems. And of course, there's great podcasts like this, which I think is another <laughs> option <laughs> for people to just uh, get their feet wet in the field. Exactly. And uh, what about specific areas of focus? Um, so uh, what are kind of the foundational skills that are important for a career in AI now? Uh, yeah, so I guess 
for some of this, the younger folks who maybe want to think about picking their courses, uh, I think having a good understanding in statistics, math, uh, and computer science in general will set you up for a, a successful career in, in the field. Great, yeah, pretty good place to start. <laughs> and what about yourself? Do you have any female role models in the field um, that you would, that you would, if you had to um, pick to share with our listeners? One of the one of the forefront people in my mind is Marzia Gassemi. Uh, she's in the public health space and from Vector, and she's helping to make sense of messy clinical data. So in the current you know COVID economy, I think her her role is going to be critical, and I'm excited to see what comes out of this next. But just to give you some background, she's designed a suite of machine learning methods that can predict how patients will fare during their hospital stay. Uh, her algorithms can accurately predict things like um, how long a patient will stay in the hospital or are, are they likely to pass away while they're there or even if they'll need interventions like blood transfusions or vent ventilators. Mm -hmm. And actually she was named MIT Tech Review's list she was on the list of MIT Tech Review's top 35 innovators under 35, which I just, I think it's an incredible accomplishment. Um, there's Patricia Thane. Uh, she's doing some incredible work in the AI security space with her startup, Private AI. Um, she's also an incredibly savvy, well-rounded founder who I think just has a really bright future ahead of her. Um, and uh, maybe I'll bring up Raquel Erdison. Uh, she's actually the head of Uber ATG in Toronto, which for those who don't know, is the innovation lab dedicated to research on self-driving vehicles. Uh, she's also an assistant professor at um, the University of Toronto in computer science. She's a Canadian research chair in machine learning and computer vision, and she's a co-founder of the Vector Institute. And uh, Uber recently announced um, that they're going to invest, actually it wasn't recent, I think it was maybe two years ago now, but they're going to invest $200 million and employ more than 500 people um, over the next five years in a software engineering hub that's actually going to be headed up by Raquel Erdison. Um, they're incredibly talented females, uh, they're powerhouses, and they're pushing the boundary of the status quo. And so I just, I love to see their successes. It's fantastic news. And Raquel has spoken at our events previously and always has, uh, well, just is really inundated with questions from the audience. <laughs> we can never have long enough Q&A. So, so yeah, some great, great names there. Um, and what would you say needs to be done, I guess, on a, on a bigger level, um, a higher level, to encourage more women to work in AI in the future? Oh, I think there's many things that can uh, and should maybe be done. And to name a few, I think one of the helpful things uh, for, for getting women into a field is to have female role models, seeing women doing, um, doing those roles. It helps people picture themselves in the role and it really avoids them developing self-limiting beliefs. I think we impose these restrictions on ourselves and seeing somebody else in the field just immediately uh, removes that boundary that we imposed on ourselves and kind of becomes less intimidating. Another, another area is, you know, you know, taking the other lens and looking at how companies can attract more females is, is your marketing tactics and strategies. You know, maybe you aren't proactively recruiting in a gender neutral fashion or maybe even pro female um, tactics to just increase that funnel pipeline, um, given it's, it's, it's drier than the male pipeline. Um, and then I think there's a lot that we can do for controlling for systemic gender based discrimination. Uh, you know, we, we do this in all of the AI models we build. And so I think it's, if we can do it in an AI model, we can do it in an institution. And the odd thing is I always hear these debates coming up about, you know, bias and the potential for discrimination in models. And by all means, that is true. These models can go awry. But I think the important thing to take away here is that they are built on historical data. So these models aren't biased inherently, they are reflecting the biases in our historical data, which is really just holding up a mirror to our historical society and saying, our history is biased. And I think that's bringing to light really, really important issues that we need to address. So I actually think AI has a role to play in, in stopping this kind of uh, gender-based discrimination or any kind of discrimination for that matter. 
yeah, well said, <laughs> definitely. Um, well, thank you so much, Paige, for taking the time to have a chat with us today. I think some of the advice that you've given to our listeners will be really, really kind of grateful for um, those of our listeners that are just working in the field kind of at the beginning of their career and starting out. Um, and also, it's been great to hear a bit more about the work that you're doing um, at TD Bank and Layer 6. So thank you again, and I hope to see you at one of our events at some point soon. It would be fantastic to have you involved again. I would love to be involved. Thank you so much for having me. This is wonderful. I hope that something I said was useful to someone. And uh, yeah, until next time.